Good evening. Sorry for joining you a little bit later than expected. My name is Aaron Bastani. Welcome to this evening's edition of Tiski Sour. We have the immense pleasure of being joined by Len McCluskey. We'll be talking briefly about his new book. How are you doing, Len? I'm okay. Good to be here. For people who aren't familiar with Len, he's the General Secretary of Unite the Union. It's the largest private sector union in the country. That's correct, isn't it? It is. It is indeed. And how are you feeling at the moment? Are you feeling happy? Are you feeling anxious? Well, and, uh, still, I suppose, trying to get over the disaster of the general election. But, you know, trade unions are used to sometimes losing. We pick ourselves up, dust ourselves down and carry on, carry on fighting. We also have the great pleasure of being joined by our very own Michael Walker, uh, a man whose cheekbones are higher than a 28-year-old currency trader in Shoreditch on a Friday night. Michael, how are you doing? Very well. All the better for hearing that. Description of myself. It's true. It's what I go for. It's true. Well, you, yeah, you know, you're only thirty, so that's fine. You should still have cheekbones. That's, <laughs> that's about. That's around about when mine mine left the scene. Um, we'll be talking about a bunch of things. Obviously, the Labour leadership, uh, the book, the state of the left, the general election. But before we go any further, I just want to talk about the breaking news today that Sajid Javid, Tory Chancellor until about two three p.m., has resigned. He's been replaced by Rishi Sunak. Michael, what do you make of this? What does it mean? It could be quite a big deal. So Sajid Javid was, well, obviously he was the Chancellor, but he did have, you know, some people People saw him as having a bit of independent thought when it came to, to being in the Cabinet. He was putting pressure on, on Boris Johnson to fall within fiscal rules. Um, so Dominic Cummings, the Chief Advisor to, to Boris Johnson, is very keen on spending lots of money, especially to try and secure those red wall seats. Um, and Sajid Javid was the pressure within the Cabinet to, you know, rein in some of that spending so that the Tories can stick to their pledge to close the deficit by 2023. Um, what happened today was that Dominic Cummings and Boris Johnson had demanded that Sajid Javid sack all of his special advisers and for them to be replaced by a joint unit of, of advisers chosen by number 10, who would be you know an advisory board for number 10 and number 11, so number 11 where the, where the chancellor is. Um, Sajid Javid wouldn't accept this. Um, he has resigned. And in his place is Rishi Sunak, who is seen as someone who is much more loyal to, much more, def or someone who's, who has more deference to Dominic Cummings and Boris Johnson. So what we could see is a treasury which is willing to spend a lot more money than we have seen from any recent Conservative government, potentially a bit more like what we see from Republican presidents. So Republican presidents, here, we, here <laughs> we associate you know, the right with with cutting spending and trying to reduce the deficit in the United States, it's often the Republican Party who like to cut taxes and spend a lot of money who increase the deficit. We could see something similar going on here. Len, what do you make of it? Well, uh, it seems to me that they've replaced one banker uh, with another banker. I have to be careful with the pronunciations of my Bs. Um, but I think the point that Michael's just made is a very interesting one about... Uh, the spending side of um, of a Tory government now, because uh, for me, uh, Boris Johnson looks more and more like uh, an American president. He's acted like that throughout his life. And the first thing an American president does when he gets elected, the following day, the only thing they're interested in is being re-elected in four years' time. And I think that's what Johnson will be looking for. He wants to break Margaret Thatcher's a period in office, and Tony Blair's. And so <clears throat> trying to hold on to Labour's heartlands and maybe releasing more money, we'll see. It's going to be an interesting period. Do you look at the ruthlessness of somebody who's just won a general election and within two months decides to get rid of their number two? Um, do you think it would have been nice if Jeremy Corbyn had been <laughs> that ruthless as the yeah. leader of the Labour Party? Uh, yeah, I've often wished for Jeremy to be a lot more ruthless. Uh, but, you know, Jeremy was not that type of individual. He was a different type of leader, as he said. And uh, he was somebody who inspired people. Hundreds of thousands of people joined the Labour Party because of him, especially young people. Uh, but yeah, I have to say there were occasions when I think to myself, I would have liked him to be a little bit more ruthless with uh, those colleagues around him who were uh, uh, undermining him. And um, I'm slightly envious of the way... Uh, Johnson goes about his business. More of that as the show progresses. We're going to start the evening off really first 10 minutes uh, with Len's book, Out with Verso Books, Why You Should Be a Trade Unionist. Um, 
talks about a bunch of things, why they're relevant for the 21st century, a little bit about your personal story. Very briefly, why did you write the book? Well, really, it was in conversation with some colleagues um, really, uh, surrounding Unite's schools program. Uh, trade unions are the largest voluntary oh body uh, within our society and yet there is no mention of them in any school curriculum uh, they've been squoozing out um, uh, and we decided that we were going to step into every school in the UK uh, every year and speak to 15 and 16 year olds and tell them what trade unions were and of course the the right-wing press in particular the sun had uh, apoplexic they thought accused me of wanting to uh, recruit kids into the union and maybe start a revolution from the classrooms. But it wasn't that. It was really about us saying that young people were the ones that were likely to be exploited very early uh, as they went out into the world of work. And we wanted to explain what trade unions were. There was another debate about soaps, British soaps, EastEnders, Coronation Street, uh, supposed to be a reflection of the communities we come from, working class communities. There's never any mention of trade unions. Uh, never a mention of trade unions, even when there's talk about strikes in the storyline. You have to go back to Brookside when Ricky Tomlinson, my my good friend Ricky, played um, uh, played uh, a, a, sh a shop steward, a, a full-time official, Bobby Grant, in that. And so it was in that discussion we decided that it was maybe a good idea to talk about how trade unions are trade unions have always been a force for good in our society and why being a member of a trade union is a good thing and that's where it sprang from so they they used to be um because when when i read that in the book it got me thinking i mean there used to be comedies around workplace and trade unions like the rag trade this is really old 60s 70s and then actually i, I I've, if it's not it would be a terrible book but you could sort of look at neoliberalism through cultural production so yeah, friends, that's a good point yeah and I, I look at like minder you know minder great comedy you know minder the labor market within which terry operates sort of day late day rate does he really does arthur really pay him on time nobody really knows arthur dale is this kind of an entrepreneur slash criminal and she tells you a lot about what thatcher did to this country and so, I mean, I agree with you. The fact that these figures aren't really there in popular culture for the last 20, 30 well, years think, is quite yeah, instructive. No, it is. And I mean, I've often said that Thatcherism, to me, was an evil creed. It effectively said that the only reason that we were on this earth was to look after ourselves. I'm all right, Jack. She was the one that said there's no such thing as society. And actually demonized the whole idea of collectivism and community spirits. Uh, which was the complete opposite to my experience when I was growing up. And so uh, the idea of making certain that people understood the collective nature that advanced our society so much and the critical and progressive role that trade unions have played in it and can play in it. Trade unions are more relevant today than they've ever been. And so that was the, uh, that's where the, the, the thoughts of the book came from. What happened to, to working class culture and trade unionism in the 1980s? Because you entered the labour market in, what, 1968? Yep. I mean, that was the sort of apogee of, you know, I mean, maybe in this country, you know, five to ten years later in terms of union density, but left-wing ideas are very prominent, revolution in the third world, et cetera. Obviously, we've, we've moved a long way from that since then. Do you, do you isolate the 1980s as kind of almost like a revolutionary period for the establishment in, in destroying class power? power? Yeah, it, 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 it actually was. There's no doubt about that. It was in, uh, Thatcher in the 70s, Keith Joseph and others uh, made a determined um, attempt to not only introduce the neoliberalism that they believed in, almost laissez-faire type of uh, approach, but they recognize that trade unions would be their biggest obstacle. And so they set out a plan to try and destroy uh, the collective nature of trade unions and destroy the effectiveness of trade unions. And so it was a dark period. Uh, the right-wing press always talk about the dark days of the 70s. Of course, if you look at the 70s, a lot of progressive things happened. The Equal Pay Act was introduced in, in, in the 1970s. Health and Safety at Work mm. Act, an act that has saved literally tens of thousands of lives over the years. 
The dark days, of course, were in the 80s when Thatcher pushed back with this creed of no society and people shouldn't help each other out. And they were difficult times. So, I mean, that's broadly agreed on the left. Thatcher, very bad. 80s, very bad. Where you may disagree with some people in the Labour Party or on the left is that, well, I don't know, I'm not going to ventriloquise your answer. But it seems to me that you feel like, and this is repeated in the book, that Blair missed an opportunity to fundamentally reorient the discussion and sort of recalibrate power towards working class people. Yeah. Was, was, was Blairism a historic opportunity missed by the left to re-empower working class people in this country? Yeah, I, I always think if, uh, if a Labour government doesn't seize an opportunity when they come to power to bring about a, a shift in the balance of power in favour of working people, I always think it's an opportunity missed. Obviously, what Tony Blair and New, uh, new Labourism and A Third Way produced uh, lots of advances, especially in civil society. So I'm not one of these people who dismisses um, Tony Blair. He gave me one of the greatest uh, nights of my life in 1997. I was in a, a club when, uh, and at three o'clock in the morning, I walked round to Smith Square, um, just around the corner where the Tory headquarters were, and I gave a solo rendition of the red flag uh, whilst uh, the cameras were waiting for um, for Major to come back. And uh, for me, it was uh, supposed to be the beginning of a new dawn. Of course, what effectively happened was uh, New Labour couldn't challenge the power of, of capital, couldn't challenge the elite and the corporate elite, and gradually uh, disillusioned people. And so it was a huge opportunity missed. Yes, we won three elections. Fantastic. I worked and voted all that time. But we were, it was always evident that the changes weren't really making a sufficient, during the 13 years of Labour government, for example, we lost 1 million manufacturing jobs. Now, during Thatcher's period, it was almost like uh, the UK was a car boot sale, you know, UK for sale. And uh, uh, companies came in from all over the country, uh, all over the world, in particular from, from Europe, and bought up um, uh, British companies and effectively then closed them down because it was easier to sack British workers, cheaper and easier. And, you know, one of the things that Thatcher, she was once asked, what, is, what do you think is your greatest achievement? And her answer was Tony Blair. And in a sense, that says it all quite disappointingly. Uh, inequality rose during that 13 years. Mm. Um, and of course, it all ended in tears with, uh, with our defeat in 2010 and the continuation then of attacks on trade unions and austerity and the, uh, the terrible misery that that brought to lots and lots of people. Would you call Blairism a failure? Um, well, I would. I like your your previous question. I, I see it as a missed opportunity. There's, but there's no, no doubt. I mean, okay, I'll clarify. There was an opportunity cost because Thatcherism was a revolution. Yeah. And every revolution, as we know, has a counter revolution. And it feels to me that Britain was crying out for a response to Thatcherism, um, and that actually Labour could have gone far further than it did. Uh, under, there's no doubt under about Blair. That. There's absolutely no doubt about that. And I think, despite the fact that. Uh, people uh, defend Tony and, and Blairism and New Labour and talk about uh, three um, landslide victories and wouldn't we have wished uh, for, for one of them um, in December uh, for Labour. Despite that, what people fail to recognise is the, the drift away from the working class roots of the Labour Party and the drift away from organized labor having the ability to challenge the corporate elite and in that sense it was a failure you know you'll recall peter mandelson saying there's nothing wrong with being filthy rich mm. perhaps it's because he knew he was going to end up being filthy rich himself and i i thought to myself at the time i don't want to hear my leaders saying that i want my leaders defending working people looking for a better share of the wealth that we create. For example, 35 years ago, um, the, uh, the wealth that we create, the, the GDP, 65% of that used to go into uh, the back pockets of workers uh, in their salaries and, and, and in their wage packets, 65%. 
Here we are today, and that's down to 50%. Now, that kind of 15% hasn't vanished. It's just gone mm. to those who already have it, the 1% and, and the wealthy and the corporate elite. And that, incidentally, is a disaster, um, even in basic economic A-level terms, uh, for sustainable growth. And that's why we don't have real sustainable growth. Our growth is based on all kinds of precarious things, in particular, um, individual, uh, the, the, the amount of debt that individuals have. So, yes, uh, Labour failed. That's a better way of putting it. Blair and New Labour failed. There will be those maybe listening to this who will shock horror and say, well, we won three elections. And, of course, there's the other issue. There's always this debate ever since I've been a member of the Labour Party, which is 50 years um, uh, this year, I've been a member of the Labour Party. And there's always been a debate about um, whether you can have power without principles or whether uh, principles are more important than power. And, of course, my answer to that is we need a Labour government. I use a terminology, what I call principle pragmatism. There are occasions you need to be sufficiently pragmatic in order to win a step forward. You always have to have those principles. And I think Labour, uh, during those uh, that time, and these were times where the economic situation was, was better and we should have seized the opportunity better and we didn't. So it failed as far as I was concerned. Yeah, I know. I know Aaron's going to ask you more questions about you know the current state of trade unionism and its its prospect its prospects going into the twenty first century. First of all, I want to talk about the nitty gritty of Corbynism and the last four years. But before I do that, you're watching Tisky Sour. You're watching Navarra Media. As you know, like the trade unions, we're not funded by billionaires. We're funded by ordinary people who watch this show. Uh, so if you're already a subscriber, thank you very much. If not, please go to support.navarramedia.com and make the equivalent of one hour's wage a month. Um, we'll go to your questions at the end. You can put those in the comments or tweet them on the hashtag Tisky Sour on Twitter. So Corbyn, uh, you were the most unite with the most powerful union to really get behind Jeremy Corbyn. Um, you know, one of, I suppose you're, you backing him was one of the main reasons that you know he he was taken seriously back in in, in 2015. Um, you had a lot to do with you know the operation. Uh, looking at in retrospect, because obviously, you know, Corbyn's leadership is coming to an end. Do you have any regrets over the last four years? Uh, well, I don't have any regrets supporting Jeremy Corbyn and John McDonnell. The role that John played has been absolutely first class as, uh, as well. I, I wrote an article for The Guardian, uh, not my favourite paper anymore, um, about four years ago when Jeremy was first elected. And I said that we were all on a learning curve the PLP, which at the time was the most right-wing PLP we'd had for a long, long time, had to learn that they were now representing a different type of Labour Party, a Labour Party that was infused by a young, energetic, radical uh, membership. I also said at the time that Jeremy was on a learning curve, uh, learning to be a leader. Um, and he improved dramatically. He improved his, his, his out, his, the way he looked. Um, his interviews got better and better and better. Um, and of course, really just going back to the question uh, asked earlier about would I have liked him to have been more ruthless? I suppose that is my, uh, my only regret. Um, now, how you, how you make a decent, genuine man that Jeremy is to be more ruthless is probably impossible. You kind of would lose the essence of, of who he is. But I, I watched in horror over these years as, uh, as he was attacked um, so viciously in the right wing media. I mean, it's, it, it is despicable. Uh, it's why programs like your own in social media are, are so important. And I'd urge people to, uh, to make donations because the the press and journalism in Britain is held in an incredibly low esteem right throughout the world. And no wonder the attacks on Jeremy Corbyn were despicable, the worst I've ever seen. Um, and of course, the attacks from within the Labour Party, the grandees, and of course, 
a parliamentary Labour Party and the MPs was disgraceful. Um, and I, it made me angry and I said things, uh, you know, maybe I said things that I shouldn't have said, but I, I was angry enough to uh, to want to fight back on his behalf. He was uh, very dignified. And uh, there's a, a regret in that. There's a regret that in 2017, when we came within touching distance of power, if the Tories had lost five more seats, then Jeremy Corbyn would have gone into number 10. It would have been a minority Labour government, but he'd have gone into number 10. Um, and we fought that election on the basis of respecting the 2016 referendum result. We fought it on the basis that we would come out of the European Union um, uh, on a deal that would protect jobs, protect investment. And he should have stuck to that, in my opinion. Um, now, of course, there was a, a tremendous lobby from Remainers. Uh, the, the majority of Labour Party members, 75%, I think, were, uh, were Remainers, but kind of most of them, 90% uh, were Corbyn supporters. And Jeremy should have explained that to them. And he should have then set about developing a narrative to win over Remainers, saying to them, we will negotiate a deal that will allay many of your fears. Um, that should have been our task. Instead, we slipped into this awful situation where because there was no discipline in the party um, and no real kind of correct uh, direction given, uh, it, it put us on the slippery, slippery slope to the disaster that we had in December. So that's a big regret of mine. I tried to stop it. I brought to the leadership's attention on many occasions that we would suffer the consequences if we were seen to be drifting into um, a, a remain area. Um, perhaps I should have argued stronger. It was difficult uh, because, of course, there were powerful voices. Emily and Kia, both running for the leadership now, were obviously... Uh, architects of the um, of, of of the policies that we eventually took to the nation, and of course the election was lost long, long before the six week uh, campaign. Uh, we'd lost the election long before that. And when, if you could put a date on it, it's difficult to put a date on it. I was I was calling for an election early on um, in the in the summer. Uh, and even before that, because it felt to me that we were sliding. And if we continued to slide, we would never be able to recover. I'll let you into a little secret. I don't think I've uh, said this publicly. Um, it's why I wanted Brexit done. Uh, and I, I had a number of conversations with... Uh, the business secretary at the time, Greg Clark, who um, who I had a good relationship with. We'd worked well on industrial issues. Um, and to me, there was a possibility to get Theresa May's deal um, through. Um, there was enough there to actually get a deal. Now, some people, and I, I understand this, especially people who were committed to remain might see that, as treacherous, but from my point of view, I always felt that if we could get tre uh, uh, Brexit done, especially under Theresa May, there would be absolute murder going on inside the Tory party. I don't think we'd have had an election in December. I would. I, I, I think she would have been got rid of, probably with, uh, with Boris Johnson replacing her. And I think we might have then been looking at an election this summer. Uh, with Brexit out of the way, it would have enabled Labour to talk about those issues that affect people's lives every single day. And I believe we would have won that election. So they're the regrets. Um, but regret supporting Jeremy and fighting for him when he was being challenged the second time around? Absolutely not. It's been a privilege for me to be associated with him. I suppose we should... We shouldn't rest on, on Brexit too long, but I just want to, I suppose, clarify how in, in this alternate history, you know, when we're looking back at what were the key moments at which 
Mm. Uh, the path was set to the front, but to, you know, to going into a general election where the Labour Party are arguing for a second referendum and it is a Brexit referendum. So, so one option is, is you go back to, to 2017 and the party settle on a soft Brexit position, say potentially staying in the single market or staying in something much like the single market. Yep. And Jeremy has it out with the People's Vote campaign and is incredibly you know, persuasive to the members and can get them on side so they're not pushing so strongly for a second referendum. Another, and I think this is probably what was the, and I can't confirm this, but my sense is that what the leadership ultimately wanted was for them to oppose Theresa May's deal, but it to get through on the basis of, yes. of, of rebel backbenchers, people like Lisa Nandy, who's also yeah, standing yeah. for the leadership. Yeah. And I don't know of those two options, which, which you would have preferred and whether you were, you know, lobbying people like Lisa Nandy to say, maybe you should just squeak through, well, they were, they squeak were through May's deal. Yeah, they were lobbying me. There was a group of Labour MPs called the Respect the Result Group, um, 40 of them. It could have been as many as 60 of them. Um, of course, they were afraid to break a three-line whip. Had, for example, Jeremy given a, a free vote, uh, then Theresa May's deal would have gone through because those uh, MPs from Leave seats, many of them who have now lost their seat, would have voted for the deal. Um, and as I say, my, my primary issue for me was not Europe. Uh, you know, my president of my union used to say, whether you're in Europe or out of Europe makes no difference if you still have a Tory government. Now, some people might think that's a bit simplistic, but there's a lot of truth in it. The only thing that mattered to me was getting a Corbyn Labour government. Um, and therefore, had those MPs, and as I say, they asked to meet me because they were looking for a shield they were looking, if I came out, to kind of protect them. They felt that uh, the trigger ballots may not have um, mm. hurt them as much uh, if they were being accused of of um, betraying Jeremy's three-line whip. So, you know, history is full of missed the, uh, opportunities. What was your response? So, so as, if I understand this correctly, it was people who wanted to support May's deal and they wanted you to come out publicly yeah. and say, look, leave these MPs alone because what they've done is perfectly honourable. Yeah. And then you decided not to come out publicly or did you come out publicly? Well, I was asked a question in one interview and a, a number of these MPs thanked me. Um, what well, would I... Would I defend them if they were being triggered in their constituencies because they'd done this? And I said, yeah, if it was only that that had caused the trigger, I'd try to explain, certainly to my members. Well, why didn't I come out publicly? Well, Unite has 1.3 million members and in many respects is uh, exactly a microcosm of our nation. And so I... Uh, had members probably, uh, you know, split down the middle about people who believed in re Remain and mm. were opposed to Brexit and those that voted Leave. Now, the interesting thing for me, uh, because, I, you know, there's been this uh, poll done by uh, Lord Ashcroft. Uh, I was asked about it last night. Like, I need a Tory peer to tell me what working people I think. I, I don't I'd say to Lord Ashcroft, stick with your Tory mates and we'll sort out what working people are thinking. The reality is that Unite constantly balloted uh, um, and, um, and polled uh, 20,000 of our members selected across, you know, our union. Um, and it became more and more evident to me that we even had lots of people who'd voted remain and wanted to remain who began to say, this is wrong. Mm. Uh, we've lost the referendum. And of course it became, I'm afraid, more and more toxic. Um, uh, and that's what led me to know that the... Uh, the disaster that we had w was going to happen. I never thought it would happen on the scale it did, but um, yeah. I want to talk about one other issue which characterised this period and relates to some of the things you said about, I suppose, in a way, disciplining MPs, but w the structure of the PLP more generally. And I think it was, it was in the 2018 conference, there was a motion about open selections. Yeah. And many people in the membership, many of, many of the grassroots wanted to introduce... I mean, you can call it mandatory reselection yep. or open selections because they believed one that would create, you know, opportunities for new blood to come into the PLP, but also it would 
you know, put some pressure on those MPs who were so committed to, you know, trashing the party at every yes. opportunity yeah, to, yeah. to get into line. Uh, many people's interpretation is that one of the reasons why open selections didn't pass is because it wasn't backed by the big unions, including your own. It is... Is that a correct account of what happened? And if so, do you regret not backing well, mandatory I'm reselection at that, I'm glad that period? Asked, I'm glad you've asked the question because no, that, uh, it, that isn't a correct um, interpretation. In fact, I was shocked at the conference in Liverpool when it came to a vote. It was very evident that the trade unions had voted one way and I don't know, 90% of the constituency delegates voted the other way. It shocked me. A number of fringe meetings I did after that, I was able to explain that Jeremy Corbyn had asked us to support this particular compromise. I was in a slightly uh, difficult position because of course my union has a policy of supporting mandatory reselection. That's Unite's policy. Um, but we were asked, uh, including the leaders of Momentum, uh, would we all, could we bring ourselves to support Jeremy's position? Now, one of the one of the things that I was slightly annoyed with uh, with Jeremy was he should have come out, made it clear that it was his position, mm -hmm. and the vast majority, in my opinion, of CLPs would have supported would have supported it and we wouldn't have had this apparent split um but that's really what happened i was given the task of trying to get the unions to support it and a number of my colleagues in the unions didn't want to support it they didn't want mandatory uh, reselection but they didn't want any uh, reselection processes and i had meetings and my argument was look we're being asked by jeremy by our leader and you know, we've always supported them, we should support them, and they fell in line. But it didn't happen in the constituencies. Mm. So I made it clear to everyone, including Jeremy, that that would never happen again. If he wanted something, he would need to come out and make it clear it was his ask. Are trade unions defeatists in 2020? Do they actually believe they can change society anymore? Well, trade unions are about bringing workers in work uh, together in order to fight for better pay, better conditions, mm. and defend themselves against any um, grievances, disciplinaries, et cetera, et cetera. And unions will continue to do that. You know, I, I'm often, I, I have a wry smile on my face when I read about newspapers saying that trade unions are now irrelevant. Mm. And when right-wing Labour MPs and, and, of course, Tory MPs saying we're irrelevant. And I, I say to myself, well, if we're that irrelevant, why don't they, why do they keep attacking us? Why don't they just let us wither on the vine? Of course, they don't let us wither on the vine and they continue to attack us because they know that trade unions are still incredibly important. We are the first and last line of defence for working people, certainly in the working arena. Now, you can look at percentages of union membership of course as our society has moved more and more to a service-based society and in particular with um, precarious work the gig economy zero hour contracts of course that percentage of workers who used to be in a union has declined however in all of the major sectors of the economy Trade unions are still very, very strong. Pick any of the major sectors and you will find that trade union density is, uh, is, is still high and still powerful. I mean, I don't, I don't doubt that trade unions are, are still the most powerful civil society organisations in the country. But I, I do wonder, do people at the very top of these organisations really believe they can ever return to the political forces that they mustered in the 70s? And I, 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 I sometimes think they don't. You know, when I think of Bernie Sanders, Johnson, Trump, Corbyn, yourself, I'm saying lots of men, Alessandra Casio cortez Ada Kalau, I think of people who think we have a project, we have a movement, if we get it right, we can change society. But I do get the sense there are lots of people in trade unions who don't actually think that, you know, they're not actually playing to win. We're going to get some screen grabs up if that's okay, Fox. These are some tweets. These aren't from you. There's not, no gotcha, don't worry. But it, I thought this expressed my point quite well. Can we get these up? Yeah, these are from somebody who works at the TUC. It's not, it's not a political attack, but it was just something which I want to bring the point out because uh, the TUC had a very different attitude towards media a few decades ago. Have you got this? 
I'll read, I'll read them anyway. It's, uh, and again, this is not a personal attack. Uh, this is a tweet from uh, the head of comms at the TUC. And they said, the, the media is right dominated. This is the water that Labour politicians swim in. We shouldn't be surprised. We're going to disrupt the status quo. I agree with all this. Um, but we should accept this, stop moaning about it, and take all the actions we can to overcome this challenge. Is it fair? No. The Tories do get to play on easy mode, but this is politics. No one said it had to be fair or easy. It just is. If you're not good enough to get a fair hearing for your ideas, maybe you're just not good enough to run the country. Now, what I find interesting is that until 19, well, in 1945, the TUC had a 49% share of a newspaper called the Daily Herald, which had 2 million daily readers. Today, we call that newspaper The Sun. Uh, and so something strange has happened in trade unionism where in the first half of the 20, 20th century, when working class people had a really tough, you know, we think we've got it hard, it was really tough to organize, etc. In the first half of the 20th century, they built institutions like the Daily Herald and they said, look, the media's rigged, the millionaires and the wealthy have got their papers, we need ours. And yet today, the atti and this is quite a common attitude, well, that's just how it is. So, I mean, what, where does that attitude come from? Where does that sort of... It comes from defeatism. Uh, and the reality is, of course, that you have to place the TUC in its correct um, context. The TUC, to a degree, and it probably has always been like this, is um, an organisation that seeks the lowest common denominator. Um, there are a number of unions. I don't know how many there are now, 59 unions. And are all, you know, unions are the same as the rest of society, same as the Labour Party. You will have some unions, which might be described by some people, not me, as being right wing. And you will have other unions that uh, are described, such as Unite, as being militant and left wing. And therefore, seeking common ground can sometimes be extremely difficult. It's precisely why the attempts to create our own newspaper, uh, and there's been a couple of attempts to do that, have failed. Um, and so... You're it, talking about the news on Sunday, things like this. Yeah. Uh, but So it's not about uh, we should stop moaning, as mm. the someone from the TUC says. Uh, it's, it's not about moaning. It's first of all about uh, articulating what the situation is. It's about raising the consciousness of ordinary working people so that they know. I think if you, if you ask people, well, do you think the media are fair? Um, I think an overwhelming majority would say no. And that's because we have to point out the unfairness of newspapers. But of course, trade unions get on and do their day-to-day -day work. Um, in, in Unite, uh, every year and other unions are, are, are similar but we recruit something like 170,000 uh, new members every single year every single year now the fact is and the problem and the conundrum is you know 171,000 drop out the other end because our uh, manufacturing base or traditional areas uh, of work continue to decline uh, because governments have allowed that to happen. The demonization of trade unions has gone on for decades now, completely different from what happens in the rest of Europe, where trade unions are treated uh, respectfully by governments and are often engaged. I mean, for example, our productivity, I think, is the lowest in the G8. Um, I remember George Osborne making a big play of it when he was around um, uh, with, uh, as chancellor before he got his other five jobs. Um, he made a plea about, uh, ab about productivity. I wrote to him and said, I agree with you. We do have a, a productivity uh, problem and I'd like to work with the government. My union would work with the government uh, in order to see if we could improve that. I never even got a reply. And that's typical of the attitude of the Conservative Party, and indeed of British capitalism, which tends to be myopic and short-termism, compared with some of the other um, approaches in, in, in the rest of Europe. So we get on and do our business. It's not about stop moaning. And I don't know what he means by that. See, it'd be interesting if he put his name to that, <laughs> the, that tweet. But the reality is that trade unions, and it's trade unions who meet ordinary workers, 
people in the TUC don't meet ordinary workers. Mm. It's us that meet ordinary members. And we get on with doing our business, every other union. I've been general secretary of my union for 10 years and it's been under a Tory government. There's a quick question before we go back to you, Michael. The TUC was founded, uh, this might come across as sort of shit stirring, it's not. The TUC was founded in an era of craft unions. You had very small unions, you had hundreds of trade unions yeah. and the TUC was this big umbrella organisation. And what's happened in the last couple of decades is you get the arrival of super unions, Unison, Unite, GMB. Is there really a role for the TUC? What does the TUC do in a context where you have million member unions like Unite and Unison? That's does there good, need to be a TUC anymore? It's a good question, but uh, we've been here before. The National Union Mine Work has had a million members. My own legacy union, the TNG, had two million members back in, in the 70s. Mm. The TUC is the... Uh, to bring all workers together and to seek common ground. And they do a good job in that. And it is about trying to make certain that uh, as brothers and sisters, we try to see if we can work together. Now, you're right, going back to 1868, when the TUC was mm. first formed, it was craft unions. But that changed at the beginning of the 20th century, where the so-called new unionism, I, I, I talk about it in the book, uh, where s unskilled workers began to flood into unions. And uh, from there, things changed. It was, it was that that created the Labour Party because trade unions at the time, back in the day that you're talking about, the craft unions relied on the Liberal Party to support them. They very quickly learned that you could never rely on Liberal Democrats. And there's one thing that's never changed in the last 150 years, uh, you can't rely on Liberal Democrat Party to fight your cause. And people came together at the beginning of the last century and said, you know, we might be winning on the industrial front, but we keep losing what we win in the political arena. We need to create a party of Labour. And that is where we come from. But those arguments within the Labour Party that we see now between right and left and soft left and centre also exist within uh, the trade union movements. And there was nothing unusual about that. It's really about trying to make certain that if there are unions that are, have similar views, I, we work, my union works very closely with other unions. So, um, it is to advance a particular cause. And of course, when you get large unions, like we currently have, uh, you, you are right in saying that, does that change the dynamics within the TUC? Yes, it probably does, but we all work with the same purpose in mind to advance our values, those values of fairness and decency and equality, uh, and that community spirit that goes with it, collectivism. Oh, sorry, I'm gonna say one more thing, because. You know, there was, I can't remember, you'll, you'll know this, I'm sure. There was a senior union official a couple of decades ago who said that there should be some sort of integration of the CBI and the TUC. <laughs> I can't remember who said it, which is basically corporatism, mm. which is kind of Mussolini, but then fascism, et cetera. We don't need to go that far. I'm sure they didn't mean that. But the point is the sort of the, the eradication of any kind of dissensus between yeah, labor and chap capital. It was called business unionism in the 80s, Chapel and Hammond. Yeah were the ones that... Um, but there's still a lot of that, isn't there? I mean, you're quite unique in the trade union. <laughs> Unite are quite unique. There's obviously others, RMT, CW, who are quite sort of, a, you know, a, aggressive in advancing a certain political position of labour and capital in this how society structured. You know, there are other unions that don't do that. And do you but, think And do you think that's a, an explanation as to why the, the left is so weak or why the sort of labour argument is so um, underrepresented in civil society? Well, different unions have different histories, uh, Many of the unions today um, have don't have a history of any militancy whatsoever. Their members are not geared that way. Um, and I, I don't criticise that in any shape or form. These are people working within a particular sector, joined a union, and they approach things in a different way. I don't for one minute say that Unite does everything right and everybody else is wrong, because that's just not true. Um, many of my colleague uh, unions uh, are um, aggressive and militant when they need to be. I mean, I think it is about how you want to be uh, perceived. My union, for example, I've never yet, uh, and I've been representing working people for a long, long time, 
uh, literally 50 years now. I've been representing workers as a shop steward, a regional official, a national official, and general secretary. I've never yet met a worker who likes being out on strike. Uh, no worker likes being out on strike. But of course, my union creates an image that says we don't want to fight. We don't want a confrontation with anybody, but neither will we walk away mm. from any bad bosses. And whatever our members want, we will always, I will always stand shoulder to shoulder with them. I'll never seek reasons why we can't support them because of some technical legal reason. I, I, I think that weakens the whole concept of trade unionism. And in that sense, there is the creation of images, sometimes exaggerated, um, which may appear to separate uh, what unions are. are and, uh, but, but all of us, all of us in the trade union movement seek those values that I've talked about. Let's talk about the Labour leadership election. Sure. The, yep. the, the juicy stuff. Uh, back in 2017, you tipped Emily Formbury, or at least it was <laughs> brief that you tipped Emily Formbury as the next Labour leader. It turns out Unite are backing Rebecca Long-Bailey instead. What changed? Well, I think Emily has changed. I'm, I'm sure she'll give me a clip around the ear if she ever hears me say this. <laughs> I, I, um, I don't believe Emily's position over uh, Brexit was was a good one, and um, and that's regrettable. But there you go. But I think, look, in the in the leadership election, I hope incidentally she gets on the ballot paper. Um, but in this leadership election. Uh, we've got good candidates, and my union had a hustings, and people came along, and we can only choose one person. It's a judgment call. Uh, uh, my union chose, and I personally support this strongly, uh, Becky Long-Bailey. We see her as the individual who can best win back our heartlands, uh, whilst at the same time... <clears throat> talk to the rest of the nation about their aspirations and now this idea that she's continuity corp and of course the right-wing press have pinned that label on her um, to try and undermine her it's actually a disgrace to do that she's an individual uh, in her own right she's very very capable she's courageous um, she's certainly incredibly capable and uh, she'll do her things uh, her own way. She ac actually believes in the radical road that Labour has been travelling over the last few years, but she'll have her own priorities and she'll do things in a different way. She is not Jeremy Corbyn. So we took that decision. And the favourite in this race at this point in time is obviously Keir Starmer. Um, he sort of quite successfully pitched himself as, as the respectable, uh, respected but also left-wing candidate. Yeah, yeah. I don't know if you're you're buying that impression that he is trying to give that he is he is of the left. Well, at the moment, I'm uh, taking everything at face value, and in some ways, it's another one of Jeremy Corbyn's legacies. You might remember. Just let me uh, digress for a quick second. When Jeremy became leader of the Labour Party, the Labour Party was an austerity party. Austerity light. The two Eds used to talk. Ed Miliband and Ed Ball, I used to meet the pair of them and say, what the hell does that mean? You're either an in, in favour of austerity or you're not. The whole of the Labour Party, the PLP, it took Jeremy Corbyn and John MacDonnell, I keep mentioning John, uh, less than nine months to make Labour an anti-austerity party. And you never heard a single uh, Labour MP uh, talking favour of austerity. That was e e excellent. And his other legacy is now in the leadership contest, all of the candidates are articulating left policies. All of them are saying, yes, our policies are good, but I might do this different or I might do that different. Now, that's a fantastic move. It's why I believe that he has changed um, Labour politics f forever. And... Uh, and I don't think it'll ever go back. How many times did any of us uh, hear, um, constantly hear, uh, on the doorsteps and whoever we were talking to, friends and family, oh, all politicians are the same. They're all the same. You can't distinguish between the Tories, Labour, Liberal. Well, he's changed that. Uh, 
he has brought about, along with John McDonnell, a radical alternative Labour Party. And that's good for democracy. And I hope whoever becomes the leader of the Labour Party understands that. I hope Kia is not trying to kid us if he becomes leader, because if he is trying to kid us, then I predict it'll end in tears and it'll be a disaster for him. And the same for Lisa um, and Becky, of course, I, I do believe. So I'm prepared to give people the benefits of the doubt at the moment and we'll see who wins. I think there's a long way to go. Uh, Kier is the, the favourite, but I've got a feeling uh, Becky Long Bailey will end up as the uh, as the leader. So let's say Becky Long Bailey doesn't win, and it's one of the other candidates. I mean, as as I say, if you believe the polls at the moment and look at the CLP nominations, it's most likely to be Keir Starmer. So one of the worries that you know we've had on this show, and many of our viewers will have, is that even if Keir Starmer is being honest in saying that he wants to continue many of the policies that were you know introduced under Jeremy Corbyn. Once he gets into that position, the experience of someone like Ed Miliband, who also seemed to be, you know, a soft left, a genuinely soft left guy, was that once you become the leader of the opposition, unless you're, you know, a hard left <clears throat> fighter like Jeremy Corbyn and John McDonnell, the overwhelming pressure is from the right. So you've got the pressure of, of the PLP, the Parliamentary Labour Party, the pressure of Britain's mainstream press, um, you know, the, the pressure of business who, who, who you want to be on side and, and, and your, your funders. Um, is all to say shift to the right, it's to say cut off cut off the unions, cut off the members, um, stop talking about class war, stop talking about um, you know these these huge expensive yeah. pledges. Yeah. All of these pressures are going to be you know bearing down on someone like Keir Starmer, and I suppose what what would potentially reassure members is if you had a strategy a better one than you had with Ed Miliband because obviously it wasn't very successful back then. How are you going to keep the next Labour leader if they're not of the left in the sense that Corbyn and Becky Long Bailey are, how are you going to keep them Well, left? Michael, Michael, you've just explained uh, perfectly why um, Unite chose Rebecca Long Bailey uh, <laughs> as our candidates, because, of course, we have concerns, um, uh, the concerns that you've just reflected on. But I assume that if Keir wins, or Lisa, uh, Lisa Nandy is somebody I've had a, uh, a strong relationship with, for over 10 years. She's very, very good. She talks in terms about building a, a red bridge, forget about the red wall, a red bridge between our metropolitan cities and um, our northern and, and midland and other area towns. And, and we have to speak to the whole nation. But I assume whichever one of them wants to, wins, they want to become uh, the next prime minister. And therefore, if it was Kia, and we're talking about Kia, I hope that Kia would reflect back on the experiences of Ed Miliband. Um, you're right, Ed was a decent man and, uh, and wanted to change. My criticism of Ed, and I don't mean this to be too personal, is I thought he was too timid. And it was that timidity that effectively um, lost him the 2015 election when everybody was expecting him to win. And therefore, Kia needs to look at that. Now, actually, in the last five years since Ed lost, things have changed dramatically in the uh, in the Labour Party. And what Kia and indeed many other Labour MPs um, will have to uh, take on board is the Labour Party has changed. And if Kia is to hold together the alliance that we currently have in the Labour Party, then that means uh, he will need to understand that any attempt to drift to the right and drift backwards would end in uh, a disaster for him because the party and the other elements of the party will not accept it. Now, I go back to where I talked about before in terms of principal pragmatism. Does that mean some of us, uh, including me, need to be a little bit more flexible in how we respond to some of the priorities or positions if Keir was to become the leader? Yes, it does. We need to find um, a, a, a sufficient united way to move forward. And that would be my appeal to Keir. If, if he wins, I'll... I'll meet him. We're the largest affiliate. Um, I don't believe any uh, Labour leader can win an election without the support of Unite. 
financial support we give is huge and way, way more than uh, anybody else. Um, and therefore, we will hopefully work together on this basis of a radical alternative. As I say, I think Becky is going to win. And um, it'll be interesting to see. Affiliate supporters, you talk about CLPs, 10% of the Labour Party membership go to CLP meetings. So there's a huge number out there. Um, and of course, there's affiliate supporters. And let me just again uh, advise your listeners. Uh, Unite has 200,000 affiliate supporters. That's twice as many as every other union put together. And they'll all be receiving an email from you recommending and they will they indeed. Vote for now, Becky it's, it's one Burton. member, one vote. So I don't, we, we, we don't know which way they will vote. Uh, we're currently polling our membership. It'll be interesting to see. Will that be publicly released? Like. That be, I'd, uh, no, I'd be interested this is, to know no, what this, the outcome of that poll this is. is. This is a private poll <laughs> that we will be conducting. And so there's still all to play for. All right, I've got one final question for myself. Then we're going to get a couple of audience questions. So you can start typing those then. And then we're going to finish with some quick fire questions from Aaron. Uh, so my final question is about strikes and the relationship between Labour leaders and strike action. Uh, this has come up recently in, in the Labour leadership election because Rebecca Long-Bailey, like John McDonnell and Corbyn before her, committed to backing all strikes in any circumstance. She said that the Labour leader will automatically back a strike. Um, Lisa Nandy I suppose hit back really against this promise. And instead of ventriloquizing her, um, we're going to watch a clip from last week of her addressing this question. And I want to know your, your thoughts about it. So every time there is a strike in Britain, the, the phone call goes into the leader of the opposition's office. Are you supporting this strike or not? When it was Ed, there would be lots of debate about it. When it's Jeremy, it's fairly straightforward. <laughs> but actually, there is a problem here, wherever you end up on this question, which is that our response has only ever been to pick a side. When actually, when I look at, when I look at the most recent strikes, for example, on public transport, essentially, you have a group of people who are working in the private sector largely, who are probably quite low paid and whose jobs are probably pretty insecure, who are simply trying to get to work. They've probably paid a lot of money to do it and they might get fired if they don't. And you've got their interests being pitted against a group of people in the public sector who are probably quite low paid, their jobs are pretty insecure and they're standing up for their rights not to be treated like that. How is it then that Labour's response is that we pick one side or another and ignore the fact that it's the system that is at fault and that needs to be changed. So Lisa and Andy's point there is that it's not the job of a Labour leader to pick a side in an industrial dispute. And the example she gives there is, is um, railway workers. And she's saying that if the Labour leadership sides automatically with, I'm not sure if it was train drivers or or she was saying bus drivers, yeah. Um, I, I think, I know, Lisa, I'm disappointed at that kind of response. She's got it completely wrong. The fact of the matter is that any service worker, whether it's in the public uh, or the private uh, arena, if they take strike action, remember what I said before, I've yet to meet a worker who wants to be on strike. The fact of the matter is that innocent members of the public suffer, and that's a, a terrible thing. It's why private it's why sector uh, service workers often uh, it, it's uh, they think more than twice about uh, taking action but of course labor leaders should always support workers on strike because workers on strike are taking strike action because they feel uh, that they ha have a legitimate um, uh, injustice against them and that's the uh, I, I i don't know why lisa has tried to pose this between people who are trying to get to work and people who are on strike. Frankly, it's a daft, uh, it, it, it's a daft thing for her to do. What we should be doing is urging employers to reach agreements with workers rather than forcing a situation where people have to take strike action. I mean, there is a, I mean, to be, to, I suppose, to pose that in a, in its most positive light. I mean, you, you could suggest that Corbyn, McDonnell and Long Bailey's commitment to support strikes, whatever the circumstances, is 
or could be perceived as a bit odd for someone who's wanting to be prime minister because you might see you know the, the historical division between I, I the labor movement and the labor party as the labor party enters government and they're supposed to be the sort of fair mediator as opposed to taking one side yes, in I, I, but, conflict but, between labor but and therein, capital. but therein lies the issue about labor it was created by the trade unions as a voice in the political arena but look People, when when my members are on strike or on, on there are issues, they want me there. I don't pick a phone up to Jeremy or John and say, we need you on the picket line. I wouldn't pick a, a phone up to, to Becky. It, it's not that type of thing. It's the essence of trying to say the demonization of unions and strikers is something that previous Labour leaders have supported the establishment, whereas... A, a radical Labour leader should support the workers. It's as simple as that. Oh, we've got a question. It's always a risk when I ask questions like this because you might, I, I don't actually know the context, you might challenge the premise. Uh, but money cannot be eaten. Nice name. Uh, should all unions back living wage foundations definition of living wage and not praise employers like Greg's who only pay £8.38, not £10.75? No, we, we, we want a living wage. We're constantly looking to fight for people to have a living wage. And certainly the £10 that uh, Labour was offering in both their, uh, the 2017 and 2019 manifesto is where we want to go. Um, oh, I like a practical question. Jonathan Powell asks, Hi Len, I switched two days ago from Unison to Unite. As a new member, how can I get more involved and improve my workplace? Well, uh, get in touch with your local official, get in touch with uh, your local branch and become active. That's what we need. Activists, they're the most important thing. General secretaries come and go. But the reality is that it's activists who are the lifeblood of any organization. Welcome on board. And uh, I hope you enjoy being a member of Britain and Ireland's largest trade union. Final audience question. Marve, tweet on the hashtag Tiskisawa. Len, if RLB wins, Rebecca Long Bailey, what are the first things she should do on one, PLP discipline, and two, media strategy? Well, PLP discipline, and I think there might be a recognition amongst the PLP that we can't have another four years of her being knifed in the back, and therefore she needs to have uh, a, a, a good shadow cabinet which draws from all parts of the party, but it must be made clear to the PLP that. Uh, the type of indiscipline that we've seen over the last four years will not be tolerated. And what was the second bit of the question? Uh, media strategy. Well, obviously, that's the $64,000 question. She should support uh, organizations uh, like yourself and make certain that we challenge the billionaires that own the right-wing press. And just to say all credit to her, Rebecca Long-Bailey has come on Navarra Media during this leadership, election, uh, leadership race. Uh, she's the only candidate to do so. You can look that up on YouTube. It's well worth a watch. And of course, all three other candidates are invited. So hopefully we'll get them on as soon as possible. You can put in a good word for us, maybe, Len. Uh, you've, got, you've got Aaron's quick fire around now. We've had, um, we've had Richard Bergen come on. From the deputy, we've had yeah. From the deputy, we've had yeah, Richard yeah, Bergen coming on, and we've had Dawn Butler, and we've had Dawn Butler. Yeah. So we're doing better on the deputy front. Three than good, in the, the three good ones. people. Right. So let's let's do some quick fire stuff. I'll just quickly say as well, you know, I think United's got a major opportunity to recruit in the media because you guys used to one of the predecessor unions used to basically be print workers. Is that right? Well, yes, absolutely. GPM, you're in our IT sector. I mean, you guys. There's a huge amount of opportunities yeah. out there for us, and we're working on all kinds of yeah. strategies. A lot of media workers moment. could join Unite, and I don't think people realise, because obviously the <clears> NUJ <throat> isn't, for obvious reasons, you know, the NUJ should be an impartial union. You don't want to affiliate yeah. to Labour because journalists are meant to be impartial, objective, et cetera. But lots of people in the media sector could join Unite. Yeah, you uh, can actually join Unite whatever job you have. Right. So anyone out there who's not in a union, come and join Unite. And if even if you're not working, you can join our community branch just for 55p a week. Come and join Unite. Come and join our family. Quick fire. Liverpool or Everton? Oh, Liverpool. And what a season we're going to have. Already champions elect. I'm looking forward to winning the FA Cup. And we go back to Istanbul if we get oh, to I the know. Champions League final. Ah. Favourite Tory MP? <sighs> that's, a, that's a tricky one. Is, is Greg still... Yeah, Greg Clark, he's still a, he, he's still a Tory MP, so... I'll, I'll ruin his career further by saying him. <laughs> it's true, actually. <laughs> Beer or wine? Uh, wine. Oh, really? Yeah. What, red or white? Uh, both. I'm ambidextrous. 
Mohamed Salah or Kenny Daglish? <sighs> Dear me, Kenny. Really? Well, I'm, look, I've been following Liverpool yeah. since I was nine years of age. Ah, I'm now 69. And Kenny uh, was, you know, fabulous. Stevie G is still my favourite. Who's the Labour right winger um, who you are the least happiest to see the back of? Which is to say, surprise our audience. You know, we had, who was it? We had uh, Richard Bergen said that he was kind of sad that Mike Gapes had left the scene because he was a bit of a comedy figure. Is there any sort of Labour right winger you think, oh, I wish they were still around? No, uh, good riddance to all of them, actually. There's a few more I wouldn't mind showing the door to. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. Um, so there's nobody you miss. Best ever Labour Prime Minister. Best ever Labour Prime Minister. Wow. I suppose you would have to say Attlee. Uh, given the incredible challenges that he faced at the time. Harold Wilson, who incidentally won four mm. general elections, not three. Everybody talks about Tony's three. Well, Harold won four. And of course, he was an MP from my hometown in Liverpool. And I had a soft spot for him. Least favourite political journalist? Oh, Christ, how long have we got? Uh, <laughs> I mean, genuinely, how long have we got? There's that many at, at the moment that even even those that we've we, we've had relationships with, Paul Wall recently is engaged in gutter um, gutter journalism. I, I I began to think he was looking for a job in the Sun newspaper, but uh, there's too many of them to mention. He recently blocked me after he wrote a piece on the basis of a email which hadn't been answered to and no named source and I said this wouldn't be printed in a newspaper but anyway well, I think that Huffington Post should be called the Huffington Sun from now on <laughs> the Nuffington Post nobody reads it um, Dominic Cummings here to stay or is it just a short haul flight oh I, I don't think he's here to stay there's something about the guy that makes me think uh, uh, it, it'd be good to have him around but I can't see the conservative establishment or indeed the British establishment putting up with them too long New Statesman or Tribune magazine Tribune how so how so we're about to take uh, shares in the Tribune oh really uh, yeah we it's are. doing very well actually yeah as a, as a business not that it's a, it's a bis business proposition yeah, that needs there's, to there's a sustainable. kind of revigoration of the uh, the magazine which I quite like of course I go back uh, when I was uh, a young uh, revolutionary back in the late 60s and the early 70s where Tribune you know had something about it Observer or the Sunday Times, you have to choose one. Well, if I had to choose one, I would choose the Sunday Times. Uh, the Observer, to me, it's a little bit like the Guardian. I, uh, ugh, they, uh, I, 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 it's I, worse, isn't it? Well, uh, well, it is. I, you know, I, I'd, I'd sooner the, I'd sooner have some respect for the enemies I know rather than those that are supposed to be on the liberal side of uh, of things. So no, no time for. Uh, the Guardian, no time for the Observer, other than there are certain journalists uh, in both of those who are decent people. What's interesting is when you read the Sunday Times or the Times, you go, wow, these people are really well informed about Tory politics, what's going on, on the inside. The Guardian <laughs> and the Observer have no idea about what's going on in Labour politics. Uh, well, that's what's embarrassing. The Sunday Times is actually quite good on Labour politics. You know, they get <laughs> scoops, at least. The Guardian doesn't even get scoops on, on the Labour Party. It's like, what's going on? Yeah. Sunday Times, you know, under Harry Evans in the 70s was a very strong newspaper. Today, it's, yeah, much better than The Observer. I'm glad. We agree on pretty much everything now. I think Mohamed Salah, I think a bit of a sensation, but then Kenny Daglish won, what, two, three European Cups? So, <laughs> bit of catching up to do. Uh, anything to add, Michael? No, let's... Although, I suppose, you, you said when you were a revolutionary. Are you still a revolutionary? I'd like to think so, but you know, I wish I was, I look at the Labour Party now, I look at the young people, I look at momentum and the energy that they have. Uh, last Labour Party conference, oh God, I enjoyed so much. The, I did quite a number of fringe meetings and there's part of me that thinks I wish I was 20, 30 years younger and I could continue to be part of that energy. And so good luck to everybody who, young people who continue to fight for a better world. That's what we're here to do. I remember when I was a young shop steward on the Liverpool docks, I read um, a pamphlet by 
one of my heroes at the time, Jack Jones. It was called A World to Win. And in it, Jack evoked a world where uh, bigotry and, uh, uh, and, and all that uh, disgraceful discrimination had vanished and it lit a flame in my heart and uh, that flame still flickers um, and I hope people out there can understand that yes they need a cause. Harold Wilson once said that if labour is not a cause then it is nothing and that's true and we need to be proud of our values and what we've achieved and we need to continue to fight for them. Great on that note thank you very much Len. Len's book, Why You Should Be a Trade Unionist, is out in all good bookstores, I believe. I did see it in foils the other day, so it's definitely uh, definitely in stock. It's, it's a good fiber. read. I, I like, it's, 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 good it's also... It's, it's good size. Good it's read. what more left-wing books should be, which is, you know, it's, it's very readable and explains something simply. So that's, you know what I mean? It, it, it does tell you why you should join a trade union. It does what it says on the tin. Yeah, Michael's one of these people that says, why... You, I mean, that's actually... It's a rare accolade. I think Michael books should say, all be this long. Well, no, because Michael <laughs> says, why read the book if I can read the Wikipedia article? <laughs> this is somebody that... Anyway. Um, great to have you on. Probably Thank get you. you on a, maybe after the leadership election is finished. Definitely. We're only yeah. halfway through. Uh, you've been great. We are back tomorrow night. Discuss New Hampshire, amongst other things, or you mm. are. New Hampshire again. Oh, wait, oh no, sorry. The The... the Chancellor stuff. You're the, res back. the resignations. Potentially, I'm not, I'm not here tomorrow. Yeah. It's if I can get someone who is not on a Valentine's Day date, then there might be a show tomorrow. If not, <laughs> everyone is being far too romantic. I cannot. Um, I cannot help that. You know, it's, it's highly plausible Mike will be hosting tomorrow night. Anyway, uh, good night.